Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, my name is Devin George. I'm the communications coordinator here at the Pike County Conservation District. We're so excited to have you all here virtually with us today to learn about Japanese knotweed. Uh, as you can see on your screen, um, if you'd like to learn more about the Pike County Conservation District, learn more about our events, sign up for our newsletter so you can be the first to hear about our events and be the first to register. Make sure you don't hit a, a full registration list like we had for this class. Uh, you can find that all on our website as well as our social media. Uh, I had a poll, I have a poll up right now. I'm asking about what kind of programming you guys would like to see in the future. Uh, what made you excited to come to this program and when you would like uh, programs to take place in the future. Uh, because we want to tell you guys about what you wanna hear about. Uh, so definitely tell us what you're thinking. Uh, we are over Zoom uh, and I hope everyone is having not too many technical difficulties uh, getting in. And this means that we will be doing questions through the Zoom chat box. So if you bring your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, uh, you should have a menu bar and there is a, a button that says chat and has a little word bubble above it. Um, we're gonna keep everyone on mute throughout the presentation uh, and we're gonna have all questions go into that box and then we will go over all of them at the end. And all the questions will be answered. Uh, so with that in mind, we are gonna get started. And I want to introduce our speaker, Vincent Catrone from Penn State Extension. He is a Penn State Extension urban forester and he is the local guru on knotweed. So I'm gonna hand it over to him and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that he can take over. All right, so I'm like gonna kick it off. Yeah. All right, <laughs> all right. So let me share my screen. Um, and Devin, you are recording, right? I, Yep. Yes, okay. and I am recording. Um, if anyone Good. has any questions about that, again, feel free to put them in the chat. Okay, well, thank you all for joining. And um, I, it seems like everybody can handle Zoom. Maybe maybe just not too many hours of it. And from the list of invasives that you all were typing in the chat, we could go on for days on invasive control. So we're, we're going to start with a little sort of intro to invasives and the problems. We're going to zip through that quickly, and then we're going to dive right into knotweed. And I can tell you, I've been working with knotweed for at least 25 years, and I'll try to explain where um, over the course of this talk. All right. So let's see if I can advance my slides. All right. So, um, you know, just the definition from USDA, US, US Department of Agriculture. So invasive plants are introduced species. They, they, and by the way, they don't have to be introduced species. So black locust is a native that is can be quite invasive. But most of them are introduced species that thrive in an area beyond their natural range, right? Their characteristics are they're extremely adaptable, aggressive, high reproductive capacity. That's how they become so invasive. They just produce so much seed, right? Uh, I had an image a moment ago of uh, Tree of Heaven, Alanthus. Uh, when we deal with Alanthus tree, we target the female trees first, right? Because those seeding trees can produce over 350,000 seeds each and every year. So we know that's, that's what we wanna take out first, right? So. There, there's, you know, we then throw this word exotic invasive into it. And exotic, again, just means from somewhere else. A lot of people ask about noxious and the noxious weeds list. The noxious, noxious weeds list really is a legal piece and not everything that is extremely invasive and causing problems is on the noxious weeds list. Just keep that in mind, okay? Um, so again, a plant that grows aggressively, spreads quickly, displaces natives. Now we're getting to part of the problem, right? Um, most invasives were introduced from elsewhere. Hey, think about it. We're invasives to North America, most of us, right? We, we came here. Um, when we look at invasive species, and, and these numbers are old, I apologize. That, so that $138 billion a year in, in economic impact to agriculture, forestry, fisheries, wildlife, ornamental landscapes, waterways, and such. Now we're talking about plants, insects, and animals 
that number's probably low because that number's old. Okay. And we know that invasive species affect biological diversity. Um, they cause population declines, some species extinctions, the shifts in predator prey dynamics. Um, and again, we're talking insects and plants, right? This is just all invasives. Um, the uh, shifts in species niches change the habitat and, and the ecosystem complex complexity gets changed, okay? So again, an old slide of mine, I've been doing this for a while, but a statement from the chief of the forest service, which, you know, for a forester, pretty exciting when they say that the second greatest, here's Dale Bosworth in 2003 says, the second greatest threat to US forests is the spread of invasive species, right? Fire, of course, for the forest service is still number one. Uh, second greatest threat, invasive species, right? Nationwide invasives cover an area larger than the entire Northeast from Pennsylvania to Maine. Wow, that's a lot of territory, right? Each year invasives take up and consume an area the size of Delaware. Uh, and invasives have contributed to the decline of almost half of all the imperiled species in the United States. Again, statements from USDA Forest Service in 2003. When we start diving into just plants and, and you know, we tend to call them weeds. Well, what is a weed? A weed is just a plant out of place. Um, but the Weed Science Society, eh, there's probably about 2,100 invasive um, plant species in the United States. And again, 1994 dollars here, you know, this, this data, $20 billion uh, in economic costs impact from just invasive weeds, okay? So pathways for the invasive, some of them were introduced, not weed was actually an introduced plant. Um, introduced from China, from, from Japan, actually, as fleece flower in the 1930s, okay? Uh, accidentally, uh, we can also introduce things, right? So things that we get a lot of invasive um, species, especially the insects that get here accidentally. Emerald ash borer, for example, came on packing crates, right? So a lot of insects are moved accidentally. So controlling invasives. Uh, and we're going to talk about controlling. Uh, I, I, you will never hear me use the word eradicate. That's not, it's not possible. Um, once something is here, we're going to work on controlling it and, and reducing it and sort of minimizing it. So prevention and plant testing really is the, the, the best place to start. Second best is early detection. And, and this is true even on your properties. If you can detect invasives before they begin to spread, you're going to be able to manage them much better, more cost effective, you know, less problematic. And again, you're going to stop that spread. So early detection is key. We'll talk about control and management in just a bit. And then restoration is, okay, so after we got rid of this invasive, what's going to grow here? Do we need to replant the site? And I can tell you, I've worked in some settings with Japanese knotweed in the understory in a, in a native forest. And once I got rid of the Japanese knotweed and got that under control, a lot of the natives that native perennials that were in the seed bank, the herbaceous plants just came up on their own. So sometimes we need to plant, sometimes we just need to wait and see, but we should think about restoration. What, what, what should be there, right? Not bare soil because we're just gonna get some other invasive coming in. We'll talk about control measures. <clears throat> excuse me, and there's cultural, right? There's mechanical, we'll talk a little bit about mechanical. And, and, you know, for some plants, mechanical pulling, cutting certainly works, right? For others like Japanese knotweed, eh, it doesn't have much of an effect on them. We'll talk a little bit about biological control. Um, and and we're in most cases, you know, we're just starting in the research. And, and I gotta say, this is where research is so important. Um, because if we can come up with a biological control for some of these invasives, boy, that's just going to save us both a ton of money, a ton of work, and, and, and chemical use in most cases, right? So we're going to talk about herbicides, we're going to talk about chemicals, um, and, and, you know, you guys are going to have to bear with me because some of these tough invasives to let them go and not use herbicides. And I know a lot of people don't like to use chemicals and like to use herbicides, 
but to the 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 option to let these things spread is worse than some targeted uh, use of herbicides. Okay, so we'll talk about contact versus systemic eh, a little bit. I mean, we 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 we're going to talk more about systemic because of the chemicals we're going to talk about. So it's contact herbicides tend to just burn something. Systemic means it goes to the root system and kills the plant, right? Selective versus non-selective. So there are some herbicides that won't kill grasses and only kill broadleaves. And then there's non-selective um, glyphosate or product Roundup, right? Anything green that it is sprayed on, it will uh, translocate to the root system and kill that. So non-selective. And then we have pre-emergent and post-emergent. Here we're talking about the emergence of the plant. So there are some herbicides that we can, and we're not gonna talk about them today, but that we can use um, to stop seeds from growing, from starting, that would be a pre-emergent. So some people use these in their gardens, preen in your, in your landscape bed, right? That's a pre-emergent. Post-emergent means the plant is actively growing and we're now going to um, use some herbicides to kill that plant, right? Okay. And there's biological control. So the classic biological control is one organism is released as a pest, right, against that. Um, and, and sometimes it's an insect against the plant. Sometimes it's an insect against an insect or it's a disease, right, disease against the plant. I remember doing some research on knotweed and there was a disease, a rust, that kind of keeps it in check in Japan. Uh, the concern would be if we bring this disease, this rust into the country here, what is it gonna spread to? Is it gonna spread to agricultural crops and create some problems, right? So again, lots of research needs to be done before any biological control uh, gets implemented in the field, okay? And, and, and they're appropriate for large scale infestations, right? So we get people who want to release beetles to control hemlock woolly adelgid, which is a whole other invasive and insect topic that maybe we do that topic in, in, a, in a few months, right? Uh, but that, that we've got to make sure that that insect works, first of all, and is effective. And then we do it on a large scale, right? So really, most of these releases are done by USDA or a state agency, okay, or a research entity. So here's a, a beetle that actually feeds on purple loosestrife. And I know uh, Bern Blossy, we'll talk about him a little bit, one of the folks at Cornell. Uh, there, there are actually four insects that feed on purple loosestrife that have been released in some wetland areas, working quite well, does not eradicate purple loosestrife, but keeps it in check, right? So there, there's a sort of success story for a biocontrol. Here's another biocontrol. Uh, so there is a disease, it is a wilt called verticillium. Uh, by the way, verticillium, we find a lot in maples. This is a, a different verticillium and it specifically affects a uh, tree of heaven, Alanthus. Very, very bad invasive out there. Uh, actually, our plant pathologist um, found this years ago. Um, we just, I, I, they're still doing research on it. It's just not bottled and has a label on it yet as a control measure because they're concerned about the spread of verticillium. But it's worked really well and has killed off these trees. So again, a biocontrol. There's another biocontrol. Um, and, and here's the thing to, you know, I, I, I've reviewed projects over the years. Uh, you know, people want to bring in goats. You need someone to tend the goats. The goats are not cheap. And I got to tell you, they don't care whether it's an invasive or a native, they will devour what's in front of them, right? They, they're, they're, they're really non-selective. So keep that in mind. I have seen goats do more damage in the forest to the bark of young trees when they've run out of things to eat. So they have to be managed properly, right? But, but they are a, a biocontrol, right? Mechanical control, there's all kinds of gadgets these days, weed wrenches that pull some plants out. And some trees, it, it really works well on some shrubs, right? So here is honeysuckle, nice root system, right? But it can be pulled and removed. Uh, and other mechanical means, you know, so here's sort of a brush hog on the front of a bobcat, right? So that can work for some species. 
uh, some shrubs, typically in combination with some herbicides, uh, mechanical removal with a chainsaw for some invasive uh, shrubs, right? A lot of times we combine things and we do some cutting and some herbicide treatment. And, and actually what you're looking at here is some of the work we've done along the Susquehanna River years and years ago, probably 20 plus years ago. And we're cutting knotweed and coming back and treating it after it re-sprouts. And we'll explain how that all works. Um, other times it's high foliar, high volume foliar applications of um, a glyphosate, right? And we'll talk more about glyphosate in just a bit. Uh, some we can really just selectively chop and squirt. Uh, so we, we don't completely girdle the tree, but we make some cuts into that tree, spray some herbicide, um, it translocates to the root system, or we cut the plant and treat the stump because we don't want it to re-sprout, right? Let's talk a little bit about glyphosate. And most of you know it as Roundup, but Roundup is um, a brand name from Monsanto. Most Roundups that you would buy have a surfactant in them. And, and really, I have to tell you, it's the surfactant. Surfactant is a sticking agent. It is the surfactant in this glyphosate product that creates more of the problem than the glyphosate. So there are products out there, Rodeo, Aquamaster, Accord, uh, Glyphomate, those are all, they're really not all generic products, they're different products. So there are some aquatic safe, Rodeo and Accord being a two of those, Aquamaster also, um, that don't have that surfactant, that sticking agent. The surfactant in most cases is a soap and it allows the herbicide to stick to a leaf and, and penetrate that cuticle of that leaf. <clears throat> so it is the surfactant, if that surfactant from Roundup gets an aquatic system, that is what kills fish and macro invertebrates. It's not the glyphosate. I, I have to sort of stress that. It is a non-selective uh, herbicide, which basically means Roundup or glyphosate kills what it's sprayed on. It doesn't matter whether it's grass or a vegetable plant or a tree. And, and it works systemically. So it moves, it needs to spend time on that plant and in that plant and move to its root system. And basically it's an enzyme inhibitor that does not allow the plant to store food. If the plant cannot store photosynthates, right? Sugar, starches that it makes, it starves to death. That's how um, glyphosate works. Has no soil activity. So people ask all the time, well, how long does it take before I go plant back in there? there's no soil activity it breaks down it it it, it it's half-life is so short and, and it decomposes in the sun it's not a problem you're not going to contaminate the soils with it um you but you are spraying it on a green leafy plant that's how it works right so again aquatic labeling low risk uh there's something called an ld50 extremely low ld50 higher ld50s that's ld50 is something called lethal dose and 50 means 50%, right? So things like Tylenol and aspirin have a higher LD50. Think about some of the stuff that's under your kitchen sinks, much higher LD50s than something like glyphosate. Uh, one of the other products out there that we use with, um, with invasives is this thing called triclopair. And uh, triclopair is, is selective in the sense that it doesn't hurt grasses right? There's uh, Garland 3A and then there's 4. 4 is an oil base, so we use that a little differently <clears throat> when we're using with, with stem treatments. Little soil activity, right? Uh, and they're also aquatic safe. We're, we're not going to talk about, tri well, we'll talk a little bit about triclopair. It doesn't work very well with knotweed, but works well on vines and this product. I don't know if it's still out there. It was a consumer-based closed product called Vinex, and it was triclopair with a little brush so that you could treat vines, invasive vines that were going up trees, or poison ivy that's going up trees, and you have the brush applicator, so really a, a, a selective way to utilize this. <clears throat> so before we get started controlling an invasive, we need to have some information about the plant. Is it an annual or a perennial? So I'm going to tell you, knotweed is a perennial. 
and we'll show you part of the problem with it, right? The method of reproduction, is it seeding or is it vegetative? Now wheat is certainly vegetative. We, we've tried to get some of the seed to germinate and we have not had good success. So most of the knotweed, and by the way, research in the United Kingdom has shown that it is one genetic plant that is just spread all over the place and it's spreading by root pieces, right? So that's, that's vegetative. We need to know the size of the infestation, the cost of the controls, resources needed, and, and then a timeline for control. So it doesn't matter what invasive you're working with, these are the things you need to know and, and consider. Now I throw this slide in here, not that I'm saying don't use herbicides, I'm saying don't use herbicides if, if you don't have a qualified applicator available. And I, and I say that, I mean, it's, it, I don't suggest anyone go out and start treating um, not weed unless you know what you're doing or, or you're hiring a licensed applicator who knows what they're doing. And I say a licensed applicator because they have a Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture license to spray herbicides or pesticides. It's a requirement when someone is doing that on your property. Make sure you read the label, right? It, it may be boring, but you read the label. It's about safety. It's about how the product should be mixed. It's right. The label is the law. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm going into a, a, a pesticide talk here, right? Again, you got to do your homework, right? What are the laws and the regs? Talk to others. Um, oftentimes herbicides are used when all else fails, which really is a mistake. It's not a good approach, right? We want to make sure that we're, we're going to control this infestation while it's small and manageable. So we shouldn't like try to pull the stuff and then, oh, that didn't work. Let's just run to herbicides now. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about resources. Lots of good stuff out there, right? And, and the Forest Service and others, uh, I said, Bern Blasi from Cornell, biological control, lots and lots of research in the last 25, 30 years. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the National Park Service have produced some really good publications. I hate to say they're probably out of print, print, right? Copy. No, nobody prints anymore. It's all digital. You can probably download these from those websites. Lots of good uh, resources out there from uh, USDA. Again, uh, more resources. You know, there's the Mid-Atlantic Natural Areas book. Mistaken identity. So there are some books that help you identify, and then there are some books on how to control. And I'm and I don't mean books. I mean resources, websites with lots of good info. <clears throat> Penn State also has lots of good information. We've got a brand new fact sheet on Japanese knotweed, um, and we'll talk about the the two gentlemen that have worked on that in just a minute. We've got a whole book on use of herbicides in in the forest, right, and how to do that safely. And these are, again, all downloadable. Uh, we've got another fact sheet on Japanese knotweed. And these are the wildland um, resource fact sheets that Art Gover, who has been our one of our plant specialists, Art's done a ton of research on invasive species controls. He's got some great fact sheets, um, worked with uh, USDA on putting them, and again, available online. Before you take any of what I say and go out and control Japanese knotweed, make sure you download some of this stuff and, and read it and understand it. <clears throat> and then of course, DCNR has some good information, mostly plants lists, what's invasives, what do we replace it with, what natives are out there, okay? So let's get started talking about Japanese knotweed since I've covered invasives in general. Uh, it used to go by the name Polygonum cuspidatum, now it's fallopia japonica and fallopia, uh, I can't pronounce the second name, Um Now, polygonum is still its family name. Um, fallopia is now its new genus name. We're going to call it Japanese knotweed, but there's Japanese and giant knotweed. Very hard to distinguish between the two. Very, very similar. So here's some knotweed growing out in the open. It doesn't have to grow out in the open. It is quite a tough plant to control. Um, and a lot of times where we see it is part of the problem with control. So we see it on the edge of a forest, on the edge of a stream. Uh, it spreads very well by flooding. 
by root pieces. Uh, we'll talk about those rhizomes in just a minute. Uh, we see it in the understory of a forest growing in the shade. Uh, real problematic because most people look at that and go, how am I going to control it and still keep the forest? And I don't want to spray anything that's going to kill the overstory, the forest, right? I've worked in understories. We'll talk a little bit about that. So again, aquatic systems, uh, certainly a challenge. And, and the best approach is to treat it, you know, in this case here, we're treating from the edge of the stream back. We're not in any way talking about spraying into waterways. Whole different permit system you would need. So you do not want to be spraying into waterways, okay? So again, let's talk about Japanese knotweed. By the way, it, it went by the name fleece flower. So that's the flower in August, right? It's typically mid to late August that this plant, this herbaceous plant flowers. That's the other sort of piece of this to understand is that the top of this plant dies back each and every year. It is not a woody plant. It is not bamboo. Um, so all of that energy is coming from the root system. You get a season of growth. Once you get a frost, the top's gone. But all that energy is stored in that root system. All right. Again, aquatic systems are a problem. So here's a piece of knotweed <clears throat> that's been dug up. Now, that is not all of the knotweed. There were rhizomes and roots going every which way, but you could just see this tuber where all of that energy is stored. So that tells us there's a tremendous source of food and energy each and every year underground that allows this plant to quickly sprout. And you know when it's starting to come up, you typically up here in April, looks like asparagus coming out of the ground. Within a couple of weeks, it's at four or five feet. It'll get to 10 or 12 feet by June, okay? The other thing is it spreads very vigorously, not by seed, but by rhizomes, underground rooting structures. It can move six feet in one direction per year. Pretty amazing plant, right? When you, when you think about it, it's, it's designed to survive, right? Some people call it bamboo, but it's not bamboo because it is not woody. The top dies back. It is hollow like bamboo. And you get these thickets and dense shades. So really nothing is gonna grow under the shade of this thicket of Japanese knotweed. And that's part of the problem, right? So in an understory, it's gonna crowd out the native herbaceous stuff that belongs there. It's also gonna crowd out any seedlings, uh, new trees that should be growing there, right? So again, very shade tolerant, grows in that understory, creates a bit of a problem, but again, is controllable. So tough, it grows out of the cracks of asphalt and concrete. I mean, look at that. It's, it, this plant just wants to grow. It is, and that tells me it is a tough plant to kill, right? Okay. As I said, it grows by root pieces or spreads by root pieces. So I see it popping up in landscape beds all over the place, spread in soils and mulches. So beware as a, as, as if you're a landscaper, if you're a homeowner, where are you getting your soil and your mulch, right? Because once this comes in, in that soil and mulch, and you've got this landscape planted, boy, we've got a problem. We, we've got to treat this quickly and manage it because it will overtake all of those landscape plants that were planted there, okay? So we wanna prevent that. So as I said earlier, introduced from Japan, um, says late, late 1800s, but I, I've found in literature, fleece flower was a big, big popular plant that was planted in the 30s. Found from Newfoundland to North Carolina, all on the east. Uh, it's probably spreading west at this point in time. Um, will grow, in Japan, it grows on lava flows, right? So, so really terrible, not sort of disturbed sites. So we find it on strip mines, but we also find it along creeks and rivers, railroad yards, so forth. I showed you it growing out of asphalt, really destroys biodiversity wherever it exists, can spread by seed. But again, I have not seen it spread by seed. It's mostly spread vegetatively. And flooding and moving of soils is one of the big ways that this plant moves around. It's not a bamboo. It's a false bamboo. Uh, very, very, again, hard 
to control amongst the invasives that we deal with. Um, beneficial, I, I don't know enough about it to say it's beneficial in Japan, but again, that's its native place. It, it, it's, it's out of its range here and that's part of the problem, right? <clears throat> so the only thing, I have not seen deer eating it. I have a few recipes for uh, making something out of it when it's coming up just out of the ground and it looks like asparagus. I honestly think it's much more bitter than asparagus, um, but we do, certainly don't have enough people out there harvesting it and cooking it. I've seen Japanese beetle feeding on it, but not to an extent that it is controlling the plant and reducing its growth and spread, right? So again, deer don't eat it. Nothing much eats this thing in our native landscapes, right? <clears throat> so when we talk about knotweed, again, I don't talk about eradication. I talk about control and we talk about reduction methods, right? So we're gonna talk about mechanical and, and, and in combination with uh, chemical and herbicidal treatment, right? So cutting it, you know, if it's a lawn and we're mowing and mowing and mowing, it can control the spread. It, it doesn't really stop it. If you stopped mowing, it would come back, right? So cutting it can, can keep it in check, but it's not a real control measure. I can tell you digging it out does not work, right? So digging it out only creates a disturbed site where these root pieces take off and go crazy, right? So not an effective control. And we've done this. I've done this experiment with biology students. One side of the trail, they cut and dug and try to remove every piece of root. The other side, I treated with glyphosate after cutting. Um, my side looked good. Um, the next year, their side had lots of new stems of Japanese knotweed. There is biological control, uh, or I should say research going on. We don't have biological control yet. And again, the gentleman, Bern Blasi at Cornell is taking the lead on that. And I'll show you some of that in just a minute. Now these, these are sort of some joke slides here, right? So um, if you all know Japanese hops, Japanese hops is also an invasive, but it has overtaken the Japanese knotweed in this setting. Right, so we've replaced one invasive with another, okay? And somebody said earlier, and I'm glad this slide's in here, when we were talking about invasives, mile a minute. So here's mile a minute overtopping the Japanese knotweed. So, you know, again, not real biological control. These are just some, some goofy things, right, that we've gotten here. Here's the thing that they really are looking at. So it is a psyllid. Uh, was brought over from Japan. I can tell you they probably were researching the insect for 10 to 15 years before they decided it was time to make a release. Uh, March of 2020. So there were researchers working during the pandemic. 2,000 psyllids were released in Broome and Tioga counties just across the northern border of Pennsylvania, New York State, right? Um, they did notice that the psyllids started laying eggs on the, the knotweed. Uh, so there's hopes that maybe we get a population of this insect that will do damage and try to keep the knotweed in control. Um, stay tuned, we, we, they're, they're hopeful, but I can tell you a release of psyllids in the United Kingdom, and I believe Canada, didn't work so well. It could have been weather, so let's keep our fingers crossed that maybe in the next 10, 15, 20 years, we do, from the work of researchers, have some biocontrols for Japanese knotweed, okay? So with that said, on biocontrols, we need to talk about reduction methods, right? So herbicides, and, and we could do this with or without a pretreatment cutting, and we'll explain that to you, why the cutting in, in just a minute. And, and there's two phases to the approach, right? There's the control phase and there's the maintenance phase. So I'm gonna tell you, it's not spray once and done. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, not, not for knotweed, right? Might for some other things. So we can treat the knotweed. We, we really, during the control phase, at least twice the first year. I'm not sure we definitely need twice. I'll explain that in a bit. Um, 
We certainly need to come back and retreat the second year. And I would go a step further and say probably the third year to spot treat the resprouting, right? And I say that because from experience, we get about 85 to 90% control. Well, that other 10%, if we let it go, it's going to take over the site again, right? So we want to make sure we're controlling it those first few years. Then the maintenance phase is we want to come back maybe once or twice a year and treat any sprouting, any remnants, right? Um, we're we're going to have to keep monitoring the, the site, right? Because knotweed is just such a tough plant, okay? So let's talk a little bit about cutting. Why the pre-cutting? And the pre-cutting to me and from my experience works really well. We've done a lot of pre-cutting with volunteers. Um, who, who cut the knotweed down. And I say volunteers, it is time consuming and it is a lot of work. We've told people, you know, swing these weed sticks and, and try to explain to them, you know, and these weed sticks are like sickles, right? We, we tell people it's going to help your golf swing, but we want you to stand far enough away from each other so you don't hit each other with the sickle. And, and it's bamboo. It's a hollow herbaceous plant. It's not woody. So hitting it and breaking it the plant just sort of falls over and, and dries up, at least the tops, right? So the positives to cutting are the regrowth that we're going to then treat and spray with a herbicide is much shorter. It weakens the plant because we're going to take some energy away from it. So we let this plant sprout to about 10 feet. We cut it. We wait for it to re-sprout. And then late season, we're going to treat it. And, and the key to treating this, again, is late, late season. If, if you're spraying any of these invasives in the spring, they laugh at you and they keep growing, okay? So, so that's, I got to say that to, to start, right? Easier to treat, right? Especially near water. We can be more selective. We can use less chemical, which is a good thing. So if you have knotweed, I'm going to tell you, you know, and it's right around the corner, June 1, go cut it down. That, that's key. Cut it down. Now, you don't have to remove all the tops. I'm going to show you. So, so I like hand sickles. String trimmers, by the way, when you're, when you're cutting into knotweed, they can clog it up, right? The knotweed is this herbaceous bamboo. It, it just sort of gets stuck in it. So I've used gas-powered string trimmers, even those with blades. I think they get bogged down. Honestly, a hand sickle swinging uh, works quite well. So this is what it would look like after you cut, right? Now, I always get the question from people, do I have to clean all that stuff up? Is that going to spread? No, the top of the plant has no ability to spread and reseed. That's going to dry up and, and just sort of decompose, right? So that's not the problem. What we're doing is we're taking energy away from this 10-foot tall knotweed, letting it after cut, sit and dry, and we're coming back and spraying the resprout, right? And that resprout, if if we're lucky and we took enough energy at the right time, might be knee high, might be waist high, okay? And and the time we're going to come back and spray is late August, early September, okay? And we'll talk more about that in, in a sec. So what if you don't cut? Well, geez, you're spraying over your head, and even with a, a power sprayer, you're just shooting over the top of something that's 10 and 12 feet tall and trying to get coverage. So you're using more chemical. You're probably not getting as good a coverage as if you had cut the stuff, right? So, you know, here's someone in the middle of it spraying either side, um, again, with a, with a power sprayer, okay? All right. So let's talk about what we would use to treat this. We're going to use glyphosate. And again, by the way, it's not Roundup. It's glyphosate. Glyphosate is the chemical product in Roundup. Roundup has some surfactant. So we can buy a generic glyphosate product. <clears throat> if we're going anywhere near water, we probably, we, we definitely want an aquatic label, right? I typically buy something with an aquatic label anyway, because um, it just, it, again, it's safer, right? Has no soil activity. It's the generics are quite cheap, <coughs> excuse me, and are effective. 
All right. So some of the product names, <clears throat> if you want brand names, non-generic, you know, Rodeo and Accord are two of the Monsanto products. And again, I don't mean to be a Monsanto commercial. There's Aquamaster, there's Aquanite, there, <clears throat> there's Glyphomate 41. There's another one, Credit 41. It tells you how much percent is in that. 41% of that product is glyphosate. So let's talk about the treatment regimes. So we're gonna cut, we're gonna wait, and then we're gonna treat. That's one approach. Or we could wait, treat, and wait, and treat again. <clears throat> again, I, I, I'm, I have preference to cutting because I really do think you're using less chemical, you're taking energy away from the plant. So if you have the ability to cut some of it, cut it. Now, here's what I have to say about cutting. Do not wait until August to cut it. You'll have nothing green to spray and you'll have missed your spray window. So cut it in June, early June, by, really by early June, because that glyphosate has to hit a leafy surface in order for it to work and translocate, okay? So here we go. We're gonna cut it to the ground. I, again, I don't care how you do it. If you wanna use the string trimmer, go right ahead. If you wanna use a, a hand sickle, go right ahead. If you wanna use your golf clubs, it'll probably work. Go right ahead, okay? Treat with glyphosate then anywhere from August 1st to September 15th. You've gotta do it at least two weeks before frost, okay? I typically hit it September 1 or the end of August. I think August 1 is a little too early personally, right? Or if we're not gonna cut, we could treat August 1 and then treat again September 15. I think that's overkill. And I think that's just, you know, to me, extra chemical used in the same season. What you really want to do is come back the next year in July and you want to retreat, right? And, and you can either after July 1, just spot treat the resprout, or you can cut it in June and treat again later in the season. Now, why late in the season? It's because the plant, and if you, you gotta understand the plant's biology, it is storing food and energy in its root system for the coming year late in the season. So what, it, what you're allowing it to do is move the glyphosate, translocate it to the root system and cause kill. The other thing you don't wanna do is cut anytime after you've sprayed it because you want that plant to sit there. And a lot of people are impatient. They, they oh, they wanna see brown. You're not gonna see brown. You're, you're gonna spray it and it's gonna sit there and it's gonna translocate. And you may not see anything happen until frost. And that might be October, right? Or late September, it depends on the year, right? Um, what you really wanna see next year is less knotweed. So don't be impatient. Don't cut it. Don't do any, you know, just cut it June 1, spray the resprout. That is key, right? So here was cut, wait, and treat. So this was a cut in June, waited, treated. This was at Milton State Park 13 months later. Pretty good control, right? But it's not over. There's not weed sprout. Then that's what you're going to see is that's why I tell people and I've argued with landscapers and landscape architects who want to instantly plant the site after treating it the very following spring. No, this is a three, maybe four year process. Until you've got knotweed under control, do not even think about planting new trees, grass, shrubs, anything into this system. It's going to take you a while to control it. Okay, so um, here is the weight treat weight. So treat the intact plants after July 1, wait for regrowth and spray in early September. I say this is tougher because first of all, July 1, you're spraying over your head. It really depends on your situation. If you don't have the, if you're hiring someone, you don't have the volunteer labor to cut it or you don't have the labor to cut it, then maybe this is the way you go. Again, I would treat later uh, and, and not use the herbicide and, and expensive herbicide twice in one year, but it does work, okay? So vegetative growth, you can see 
uh, it, it is a herbaceous perennial, right? So it's constantly, it, it does get some seed late in the season. Seed's really not the problem. I don't see a lot of seed. I see a lot of flowers and not seed. So you can cut in June and then again, glyphosate after July. Later's better, right? So we've even sprayed in late September and got control. You just got to beware of frost. You don't, you, the, the glyphosate needs to sit on the plant for about two weeks to do its thing. So if you sprayed and five days later you had a frost, you're probably not going to get great control of that root system. Okay. So some follow-up approaches. Continue treatment, right, to release the desirable vegetation. It really does work. If, I, if I've got time, I'll show you a picture of a trail that we treated. Um, install desirable vegetation and continue to manage. It, this isn't a walk away thing, right? We're, it's not a spray and done. Okay, we got to keep monitoring. Uh, at least two years, I would probably say three years. Okay, I would push that. Unless you're going to grass and then you're going to treat maybe with garland, which is a grass safe herbicide. That's certainly something you could do. And we've done that in park settings, right? Okay. So again, here's seeded after one season of control. You got so much knotweed growing up in that grass. You're going to have to go back and treat it, right? Um, we're not going to really talk about these uh, herbicides, but the one I did want to touch on is a mazepair. Uh, and a mazepair does have an aquatic safe labeling. So it goes by two names. This is really interesting about herbicides. So habitat is being used by, uh, you know, restoration ecologists to deal with invasives and has an aquatic safe labeling. And then the, the other brand name is Arsenal. An Arsenal, it's the same chemical. It's used by the utility companies for right-of-way management. Here's the thing about a mazepair it has significant soil activity. So you really don't want to use this stuff. We, we've used just a couple of ounces in maybe a hundred gallons to give the glyphosate extra kick. Um, and by the way, the glyphosate, we're, we're mixing at a high rate. So like a 2% rate is what we are mixing glyphosate to deal with um, the, the uh, Japanese knotweed, right? So 2% glyphosate, the rest of it is water, the carrier. Right. Habitat or arsenal, this mazepair is a bare ground uh, material. So it'll kill all the plants and have soil residual activity. So again, you don't want to use this in an understory of a forest. You will start killing trees. That's why sort of this slide is in here. I just wanted to share that. By the way, triclopair, which was that Vinex that I showed you, our research has shown not very effective on uh, Japanese knotweed. Works on other things keeps the grass alive, uh, but doesn't, doesn't really kill Japanese knotweed, okay? Then we've had people who have suggested and tried stem injections. So it's like taking a syringe and we are injecting into the hollow piece of the, um, we're, we're, so we're injecting glyphosate into the hollow stem of the knotweed. Um, tedious and, and not, very, not very productive. The other thing is it, it's, it, it doesn't improve efficacy. Uh, and, and that's because inside that hollow, there's, there's some chambers. It, it's just, uh, I mean, if you want to try, if I had maybe a small patch and this is the way I wanted to go, fine. I would still suggest you cut to take energy away from the plant and come back in. But stem injection really does not work well with this plant. So here I want to sort of wrap things up and show you uh, a stream project. And by the way, uh, if any of you want more information or can't remember the websites, Google Art Gover, Penn State, and you will find all of those fact sheets. So he was, he's our researcher who has done, again, 25 years of work, uh, working, working a lot with state parks recently. Um, so here was a project, 12 miles of stream bank, Titicum Creek, um, so you had 320 hours of cutting and treating. That's the control phase. The maintenance phase, and, and again, he's, he's keeping track of this because that's what you know, DCNR and state parks wants to know. What is it really going to take to take back our stream banks from Japanese knotweed, right? 
So maintenance phase, 16 to 24 hours a year, not bad. The, the initial phase, a lot of cutting, a lot of treating. Uh, so here was the bank. And by the way, when I've talked to Art, and, and I showed you a picture earlier, if you're cutting this the stuff on the stream bank, really, really helpful. And when you go back to treat, you were standing at the edge of the water spraying back onto the, the bank, right? You're not spraying the other way. You're, you're not spraying into the water. It's just not done, right? So we're still doing a terrestrial application of glyphosate. And, and again, the cutting really does help. So here's the banks full of knotweed. That's them controlled. I hate to say a few years later, there's no Japanese knotweed, but it's been inhabited by stillgrass. So I don't know, you know, <laughs> what's worse. Although I, I guess we could plant some trees here now and, and try to get a riparian buffer planted again. But the stillgrass seed bank was there. And once the knotweed was gone, the, uh, the stillgrass took over, right? So let me just show you a few quick slides here. One of the areas that I worked in. So that's what the trails of the Wilkesbury Riverfront Parks along the Susquehanna, right across from Wilkesbury, is a 91 acre riparian forest. There is Japanese knotweed. Um, this was years ago. It, it be, really became a, a, a sort of a safety issue, but it was also an ecological issue. So we did lots of volunteer cutting, some treatment, spot treating, and spraying, backpack sprayers, right? We're not doing anything too crazy here. Um, the sides of the trail, that, that's without knotweed. And the amazing thing that we discovered was just treating the knotweed allowed the native plants in that soil, in that seed bank to begin to flourish. So we started seeing things like jewelweed and, and Virginia bluebells. And, oh, sorry, that's not in the forest, but Solomon seal coming in in the forest, uh, Virginia creeper coming in. So the native stuff was there. It just needed to get rid of this big, bad, invasive 12 foot tall giant that was shading everything out. Uh, the other sort of piece of this story here was, uh, and I alluded to it earlier, it was an experiment, right? So I had a biology professor and his students, they cut and dug one side, I cut, and treated and you know my side looked better the following year and and to me the the the, the amazing thing was i had so this committee had big folks from sierra club and audubon and the folks from audubon came up to me and said i can't believe how good it looks and they thought it was going to be brown the next year and I said, no, you know, we were controlling the knotweed and controlling it so late in the season, right before frost, that come spring, once the knotweed was under control, we did, it did really open things up and allow for some native plants to compete with it and come in. So it wasn't, I, and I share that because there's a lot of perception that, oh, you're going to spray and it's going to be nothing but dead brown stuff the next year. That certainly isn't the case because of the seed bank. Hopefully you don't have Japanese stillgrass that's gonna pop up. But again, it's another invasive stillgrass is a five-year control program. So uh, with that, I will stop and uh, open it up for questions. Devin, are you there? Yep. Uh, all, right. all right. So that was sharing. a great presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, the very first question is from Olga. Uh, and she says, in the first year after cutting it, uh, the very first time, can I plant something in its place and then spot treat each no. new growth without harming the new plant? No, don't no. bother. Don't bother. <laughs> Sorry. Not unless you want to take the chance of killing whatever you're planting. So tr treat it, monitor, treat, uh, give it at least two years and, and then uh start planting something, see what comes up. What's, what's there and what's native that's there. So. Okay. Uh, Eric Frawley asks, doesn't glyphosate cause cancer? What if you use well water? What if you use well water? Well water. 
oh, no, it's, it's so glyphosate's not going to get in your well water. Uh, I said, read the label. I say, read the label, because if you read the label on glyphosate, it says gloves, right? Rubber gloves, uh, long sleeves, long pants. Don't go out there in shorts and flip flops and have a uh, dermal exposure to glyphosate. Uh, the other sort of piece of it is it's the long-term use of glyphosate. So we're not suggesting you go out and spray glyphosate every day. So if you're concerned about glyphosate and the potential for it causing cancer, it's the long-term or chronic use of it that may cause cancer. I could say the same is true of pumping gas and putting gas. Gas is a carcinogen, yet we all fill our mowers up. So again, I'm, I'm not, this, this is, you got to use it safely. You got to use the PPE, the protection equipment, right? Rubber gloves, long sleeves, long pants, right? No flip-flops, no dermal exposure. You don't want to be soaked in the stuff, okay? But as far as your well water, not going to move anywhere in that soil. And, and you're spraying the leaves. You're not soaking the soil. That's key. So you're not spraying to the drip. You're spraying to, to, to cover the leaves. If you're concerned, you know, again, hire a, a licensed applicator, hire a professional to do it. That's that's the other way to go. So, All right. Uh, Olga asked, how can the seed bank survive after the surface spraying? Spray has no effect on seeds and has no effect on the soils. You can actually spray glyphosate in your garden right now. Tomorrow you can go plant in it and you won't have any problems. Now, I wouldn't do that because you're not gonna kill the weeds that are there overnight, right? So you, you wanna let the glyphosate sit for, if you're gonna kill off the weeds, the glyphosate sits, translocates in the plant, kills the root system. So it's not gonna have any effect on seed bank. The other interesting thing is seeds, and there was a, there's a seed experiment, Michigan State, seeds that are close to hundred years old will still germinate. So it depends on the species. There are seeds that will sit around for a very long time. One of those seeds that's an invasive that really is a problem is Japanese stillgrass. Japanese stillgrass seeds survive for five plus years. So even if you were pulling Japanese stillgrass, you're talking about pulling it or spraying it for five plus years to deplete the seed bank. So the seeds, that, I hope you have native seeds. That's the key. Right. So see what's going to grow back on that side after you kill off the knotweed. A great follow up to that is uh, Thomas asks, are there any native local plants that are particularly good at taking control of an area after you've cut back and sprayed to control the knotweed? So are there any native plants? Well, I guess it's going to depend on the site. So as I showed with the Titicum Creek site, where the stillgrass came in, probably the best thing they could have done after controlling the knotweed was to replant that stream bank with some native shrubs that, that'll tolerate, sort of hold that bank in place and some native trees and, and get them established, right? And I think they still could do that even though they're stillgrass, right? So, you, but stillgrass is very shade tolerant, so that's a problem. So I say it depends on the site because if this is in an understory and it's a shaded site, then you are going to be looking at plants that will tolerate the shade. Solomon seal, jewelweed, uh, what is it, turtle head. There's, there's a bunch of shade tolerant native perennials, herbaceous plants that will grow in the understory. Virginia creeper, there's another one that'll, that'll spread. Um, if, this is a, if this is an open sunny site, and you're going to convert it to something you can mow. Well, you know, two years of killing off knotweed and then maybe plant some grass seed and mow it. So it all depends on the site. Uh, so the next make question any, is... Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought it did. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're first cutting in June and then mm -hmm. waiting for the stems to grow a bit before spraying right. for the first Correct. time. Correct. Right. Okay. Yep. Right. And, and you're cutting... You're cutting the beginning of June because you don't want to wait too, too long into the summer because you want it to resprout. And hopefully the resprout that you're then going to target with some glyphosate is about as tall as your knee. So you're not spraying over your head. You're not right. And, but so again, 
don't wait until August. They go, oh, I forgot. I got to cut the plant down. Probably too late to cut it. Okay. All right. And Jason says, I've read about using tarps to cover large areas. Is that at all effective? Not effective. Not you effective. start growing through asphalt. When you take the tarp <laughs> off, it'll come back. You can try. It, 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 and actually, they did some work. Uh, oh, it was the National Science Foundation um, down in Philadelphia years ago. This is probably 20 years ago. They tried um, actually tarps, black plastic worked for a while you know it, it doesn't once you remove it it the the knotweed's so aggressive it'll come up or the rhizomes will spread and and start shooting up away from that black plastic or tarp so all right and courtney says when you cut the first time can the cutting stay there do you yes. need to remove them yeah so that's what i was trying to show with the slide is that leave the, the tops of the plants do not spread they don't reroot they're 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 hollow plants that are going to dry up within a week right and i don't mean they're going to disappear but they're going to dry up and they're just going to be sitting there if it if it disturbs you you know how it looks eh, rake it up i guess but I, I mean when i do acres of this i do linear i think we've done 15 linear acres of knotweed in one year and you know we just let it lay cut it down let it lay and then when we come back the end of August, believe me, there's stuff that has re-sprouted through it. And that's your target to, to, to treat. All right. That was our last question. So if we don't see, oh, hold okay. on. Nope. I see great, great presentation on a very depressing <laughs> topic. Yeah. Uh, it's not just knotweed that's depressing. It's just the invasive species. Uh, and, you know, and like I said earlier, you know, when I see the chief of the Forest Service saying invasive species are the second biggest threat to our forests, um, that's that, you know, I, I, I'm going to worry more when they say it's the first, right? But it is a problem and it's not, you know, we see invasive, new invasive pests each and every year. We've got spotted lanternfly that's now coming. Um, we had emerald ash borer, you know, gypsy moth was one of the first non-native invasives that's still, you know, and, and that's a biocontrol success story um, in the way that we treat it, but it, it's, it's still a problem, right? And still wreaks havoc to our forests. So um, yeah, I, I, but, but here's what I'm going to tell all of you is do something versus do nothing. Right. So we've got to be part of the solution. So if you've got some knotweed, right, try to treat it. You know, and again, if you want to try just cutting it to start, go right ahead. If you want to try a, a little experiment with black plastic, go right ahead. I mean, we've done a lot of this over the years. You might want to take another stretch of it and cut it and treat it with some of the glyphosate. Right see what works so so you can actually see i mean i i know from doing it I, I hate to say it's just one of those big bad invasives that i've got to go to glyphosate now i'm glad i can go to glyphosate and don't need to go to amazepare or arsenal um i also know that i'm treating late in the season and i've got some native seed bank that's coming back um i i, I you know I, I hope you get some of it under control. It's just never going to be eradicated. I mean, it's going to spread by the next flood or, you know, and, and as I said, prevention is key. So any of you that are moving plants, moving soils, moving mulches, beware, right? And when you find a little spot of something, treat it quickly before it goes and, and spreads to the rest of the forest, right? So, and, and yeah, somebody just said, when can we see the presentation in Japanese Stillcrest? <laughs> yeah, I mean that that is that is another one that's long term. You can cut before they seed. You can pull and bag. Um, if you've got a small patch, that works. If you've got an acre of it in the understory of the forest, then you're probably looking at some herbicides that just affect grasses or some pre-emergence, right? Um, which which 
really are some other problems then, because if you're using pre-emergence, you're going to affect some of the other native plants that should be sprouting, you know, the trout lilies that should be coming up in the forest this time of year. So con control the invasives when you got a small patch. That's sort of my take home message to you all before it takes over your stream bank. <laughs> uh, I'm going to sort of combine two questions because it seems like they go together. Uh, uh, Courtney asks, can you throw it in a river? And then someone else asked, uh, I heard that it's very risky to leave it there because it can start uh, the tops because it can start a whole new growth, which is how it spreads across rivers. No, the tops, the tops will dry out. The tops have no ability to, to reroot and sprout. So don't, and, and I think about this, you're cutting it in June. So as soon as you cut that plant, you've disrupted its vascular system. The top now has no water. It's going to dry out. It's, it's a herbaceous plant. It's meant to die in the end of, you know, the season. If it was a woody plant or if it was a piece of root, that's different. So if you're digging it up, um, any of those root pieces that you move around or they float somewhere, yeah, you're going to spread it again. The tops are not a problem, okay. right? So what was the other question along that? Uh, do we know whether the nodes of the above ground stalk can grow into a new plant if it ends no. up floating downstream? No, no. not at all. It won't happen. No, all right. no. What I mean, if it, if, if it was a, a, a section of stem from a willow or a silky dogwood or one of the shrub dogwoods oh yeah they they will and and they're and they're native right but we do those and we stick them in the ground and they reroute because they're a woody plant that has lots of stored energy and they can create some roots right so there's a whole thing called live staking that we do along streams that works the tops of these it, it's like taking your tomato plant, let's say, right? another herbaceous plant, you cut the top of it and you leave it, it's never going to grow roots. Now, the tomato root system may sprout. If you cut the top off, you may get a new sprout because the roots are alive, right? And that's exactly what's happening with knotweed is the roots are still alive. We've taken, we've stolen some of its energy that it would store that year by cutting it. We're allowing it to dip into, or I should say, we're making it dip into reserve energy in June to put out new sprouts. And then we're going to uh, put some uh, herbicide that gets translocated to the root system and kills the roots. And again, we're not treating the soil. We're treating the green leaves of the knotweed. Okay. So we're not spraying to the drip. Read the uh, label. <laughs> That's a good takeaway from today. Read the label. Read the label. Uh, John asks, uh, when can we see a presentation on Japanese stilt grass? And to that, I will say, uh, we may be having more invasive right. programs like this one in the future. Uh, if you'd like to find out about them, go to our website, pikeconservation.org. And then a question back for you, Vincent, is uh, how long does arsenal keep killing in the soil? <laughs> 10 weeks. 10 weeks. Yeah, you don't want to use arsenal. I mean, it's it's a bare ground. First of all, you can't buy arsenal because <laughs> it's a restricted use chemical. You could buy glyphosate. Uh, I don't believe you can buy arsenal, although these days you could buy just about anything online <laughs> from any state <laughs> and it'll get shipped to you. But arsenal is designed as a bare ground or was designed as a bare ground herbicide. So arsenal, which, by the way, is a mazepair. Uh, mazepair was used, and, and again, in arsenal and also in this new name, Habitat, the utility industry used it around sub electrical substations where you can't have anything growing that's going to touch the conduct, right? So they would spray arsenal, and you'd go to a, 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 a substation, and there'd see nothing but bare dirt. And you go, oh, okay, but they, they're just killing everything, right? So that's how arsenal was, and amazepair was originally used. Now, beware if you are, and this, this is aside from Japanese knotweed, if any of you are buying extended use Roundup in the gray bottle with the X on it, don't use it around any plants because it has a little bit of amazepair in it. It's meant to control the weeds in your patio. Right, the things that grow up through the cracks of the pavers, 
Now, but because it's got a mazapar in it, if it hits a root of your tree or your plant that's in that patio or next to that patio, man, you're going to kill them. So not a, I, my opinion is Roundup extended use should have never been put on the market. I've seen a lot of trees die from it in landscapes. So beware if you are using any of that stuff. And again, you know, you use all of these products safely. You read the label with the right PPE. You're going to protect yourself. Um, you know, there are folks who are concerned and, and, and rightfully so. I mean, you're concerned about your health. Um, you want to use any of this stuff safely. Uh, I mean, we probably should all be wearing rubber gloves when we put gas in our lawnmowers or in our vehicles, right? Or, I mean, I've used Clorox. How much Clorox has been used during the pandemic? I worry about that. That is a biocide, kills everything. By the way, don't pour Clorox on Japanese knotweed. And, and I say this because I, this was done by, <laughs> there was someone years ago who sent me pictures. She had poured Clorox on the Japanese knotweed that, were, that was around her tree. Well, her tree died, her big oak tree died. Uh, that is a misuse of another pesticide. By the way, Clorox has an EPA registration number and label, and it is a biocide. It killed everything in the soil, including the roots of that oak tree, right? So the stuff under your sink is a lot more dangerous than some of the stuff that we use specifically to kill plants, okay? So I'll stop there. <laughs> be, be safe. And, and again, hire professionals who know what they're doing with a license if you're, if you're going to go down that route, okay? All right. Those are all of our questions. So I just want to say thank you again to Vinny Catrone from Penn State. And thank you all so much for attending. Uh, as I said, if you'd like to find out about our future programs, follow us on social media or go to our website, pikeconservation.org. And I hope to see you all next time. I'm going to be sending out the recording of this presentation later this week. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Devin.